Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be um, able to present and kick off this uh, really great conference uh, today with this tutorial on variational quantum algorithms. This is a class of algorithms from all of these individuals, and I just want to thank them um, for all the things that they've uh, taught me. So let's begin just by discussing sort of a broad um, sort of motivation for why one would want to think about this class of algorithms at all. Um, well, the first reason, which I sort of alluded to earlier, is the question of what can we achieve with these sort of noisy intermediate scale quantum devices that we currently have. Um, we know that they're not the full fault tolerant devices that we ultimately want to use um, for quantum computing, but it would be great to know what are the limitations of these, um, of these particular devices. Secondly, it may be possible that we could already reach some um, task that allows to achieve quantum advantage um, even using these devices, quantum advantage here is um, basically the ability of a quantum computer to perform some task that is not classically tractable in a reasonable amount of time or computational effort. And so, for instance, problems dealing, say, with quantum chemistry might be accessible um, already in this regime. Um, even if uh, we ultimately need fault tolerance to be able to achieve quantum advantage, it's still useful to think about these kind of VQAs because we could obtain for instance, useful primitives, you know, parts of circuits and algorithms that could be incorporated into other more advanced techniques in the future. And finally, from a sort of an intellectual point of view, it's interesting to study what are the different structures, features, and say capabilities of parameterized quantum circuits in general. Of course, there may be many other reasons for thinking about these things, but I think this already suffices to give some motivation for the topic. So let me also um, start off with a bit of a disclaimer because VQAs is really a massive field. There's been many, many papers um, that have appeared since the beginning. And it's certainly not possible for me to cover all of the important work in the field within a single hour. And even if there was no time constraint, I certainly am also not an expert on every uh, aspect of this uh, uh, line of research. Um, so I just want to apologize in advance for any oversights on my part. Um, and in particular, I'll just note that um, I'm not going to really discuss the role of machine learning at all in the following, even though that's a very interesting and active area of research um, in connection with VQAs. So let's then start uh, back at the beginning uh, from a historical point of view with the introduction of the first VQA, which is the Variational Quantum Eigensolver. And this paper from uh, 2014 um, was sort of a tour de force, which not only proposed the, the application of a variational eigensolver, um, theoretically, but also demonstrated it on uh, hardware using photonic qubits. And in this work, a simulation was performed of the ground state energy of a helium hydrogen uh, molecule. So the general structure of the variational quantum eigensolver is the following. Suppose that you have some uh, quantum Hamiltonian H, and that's given as input, then the goal is simply to calculate the ground state energy, EG, and the ground state wave function, psi G, for this Hamiltonian. This is, uh, approach is fundamentally based in the variational principle in quantum mechanics, which is uh, very well known. And in fact, nine out of the 10 uh, books that I own on quantum mechanics all discuss the variational principle. Now you may be wondering who needs 10 books on quantum mechanics? And the answer is actually nobody does. Um, and especially not when you have to move halfway across the country and you have to think about packing them up, but I digress. Um, the content of the variational principle is quite simple. It simply states that the energy expectation value in the ground state has got to be less than or equal to the energy expectation value in any other state in the quantum system. For instance, one parameterized by some variational angles theta. Then given some parameterized wave function like that, one can simply minimize the value of the energy expectation over the different variational parameters and thereby obtaining an approximation to the ground state energy and to the ground state wave function. So to give more of a broader uh, overview, the VQE is one in particular example of a variational quantum algorithm. And the general structure is shown in this flow chart, which is taken from a recent review by Cerezo et al. On the left, you see uh, the various uh, parts of input that go into this type of algorithm, including possibly a training set of data um, for instance, for a machine learning application, but also the cost function to be minimized and the particular onsets for the wave function that is to be studied. Given this input, one prepares the onsets with a set of uh, initial parameters on the quantum computer, 
um, generating the desired onslaught's wave function, and then one measures the corresponding cost function. As a result of these measurements here, one then feeds the, uh, these results into a classical computer to optimize the variational wave function in order to minimize the cost function. And this is repeated iteratively in a loop here until some desired uh, error tolerance is achieved. And the final output of this whole process is then, for instance, the quantum state, that is the ground state of some Hamiltonian, for instance, or maybe some probability distribution or bit string that encodes the solution, say, to an optimization problem. So in the following, uh, I want to discuss several uh, key considerations that one has to take into account when constructing variational quantum algorithms. First, I'll look at the role of the objective function, different choices that can be made uh, with regard to that. Then I'll discuss the issue of how to perform measurements uh, in these algorithms and different strategies in order to reduce the measurement requirements. Then I'll discuss a little bit about challenges associated with optimization of um, these sorts of algorithms. And finally, I'll talk about strategies for mitigating the noise that's uh, ubiquitous in the uh, present day quantum devices. So let's start then with the objective or cost function. Well, this function has several different uh, features that are desired. First, it should be a function that is faithful in the sense that it contains the solution of the problem that you want to solve. Um, it ought to be efficiently measurable in order to make it practical for uh, realistic uh, devices. And it should also have the property that a lower value of the cost function corresponds to a better solution. So if in case you don't actually manage to get to the true uh, ground state solution of the problem, and you can only sort of approximately minimize it, it would be good for um, this to correspond to at least a close uh, approximate solution. And finally, we would like the objective function to be trainable in the sense that it is possible to find the solution in some reasonable amount of time. So what then is the general form of the objective function? Well, as in the case of the VQE, um, it's essentially an expectation value of some observable operator A, for instance, acting on a particular um, state, which is parameterized by uh, variational parameters theta. So that clearly uh, depends on two different things. First, the observable measured A, which could, for instance, be the Hamiltonian of some uh, quantum uh, mechanical system. And then also the ansatz, which is the parameterized wave function. This in itself is composed of sort of two different parts. One begins with a particular reference state, which may be, for instance, the all zero state on the computational basis or the all plus state, or it could possibly be something inspired by the problem at hand, such as the Hartree, Falk, or mean field uh, ground state uh, solution, which can be determined classically. Um, then acting on this uh, initial reference state, one has a parameterized circuit, which then defines the um, full ansatz uh, wave function. And that's shown here um, on the right here. So the um, different objective functions that one can realize, of course, uh, depend very much on the problem at hand. And sometimes there is a pretty obvious choice of what that objective function should be. As I already mentioned, for physical problems, it makes sense, for instance, to consider, say, the total energy if you're looking at for the ground state, or the variance in the energy if you're interested in a particular eigenstate of the, pro of the uh, Hamiltonian. Another possibility would be, say, the fidelity um, of your trial wave function with um, a particular state that you're trying to create. And then there's more general um, scenarios as well, where you have, for instance, some sampling task where you may want to um, calculate the free energy, which requires looking at, say, uh, a Gibbs state, a mixed state, um, and therefore some sampling. So what then are the properties of a good ansatz? Um, well, we know that quantum coherence uh, in the devices that we have at present is very limited. And therefore, um, if the circuits become too deep, uh, the quality of the uh, calculation will degrade. And so it's important to try to make our ansatz as, as shallow circuits as we possibly can. Secondly, we also have to remember that classical optimization itself is not an infinitely powerful resource. If your ansatz has too many different variational parameters, it will become correspondingly more difficult to optimize that ansatz. And so this should also be kept to a minimum when possible. And finally, it's uh, of course important that 
the ansatz span the space, the uh, subspace of Hilbert space in which the solution uh, lives in order to achieve an exactness of the uh, corresponding result. So um, the different ansatzes are very often uh, categorized in sort of two large distinct groups. One is so-called problem agnostic ansatzes, which uh, don't really depend on the details of the particular problem, but are quite generally uh, applicable. And the other category are so-called problem terror ansatzes, where you sort of build knowledge about the particular problem into the ansatz itself. Um, and these categories are a little bit flexible depending on how you think about it. Um, but I'll give a few examples in the following. So in the uh, class of problem agnostic ansatzes, one uh, very common and um, useful ansatz are the so-called hardware efficient ansatzes as studied by Kandala et al. And the key idea behind a hardware efficient ansatz is that one attempts to use gates that is sort of natural or native to the particular uh, type of hardware that you have available. And by using those gates, one hopefully will achieve um, higher you know, gate fidelities and therefore allow the computation to be more accurate. So in this uh, figure here from this review article, one sees various blocks here in blue. Um, we have the variational parameters being encoded as single qubit rotations acting on the individual qubits in the system. And then that's followed in the green blocks by these entangling operators that generate entanglement. And these are selected to be um, particular gates that are very natural and can be realized with high fidelity on your particular uh, hardware. A somewhat similar uh, looking ansatz are the so-called bricklayer or checkerboard ansatzes, which are sort of these dense circuits here with many, many gates uh, layered upon each other um, in this fashion here. And this uh, uh, ansatz has been explored in, in many different papers, especially in um, the quantum machine learning uh, literature. So by uh, choosing this sort of dense structure here, one has a really high degree of expressibility in the um, overall uh, subspace that one can explore. Finally, uh, thinking a bit more about chemistry, there's the so-called unitary coupled cluster ansatz that I'll discuss in a little more detail uh, later. But uh, suffice it to say here, this is a, a sort of in-between agnostic and tailored in that uh, it's sort of inspired from classical methods in computational chemistry, where one looks at various uh, single, double, or higher excitations um, acting on a system, say, starting from the mean field or Hartree-Fock solution to the problem. On the other hand, with the problem, more problem tailored ansatzes, this too can be broken down into sort of two uh, categories. On the one hand, we have fixed ansatzes that are nevertheless problem dependent. Um, one famous example is the QAOA ansatz or algorithm which is used uh, in optimization problems, and I'll discuss that in a bit more detail later. There's also the so-called variational Hamiltonian ansatz, and which uses terms in the Hamiltonian to define uh, the wave function, uh, the parameterized wave function. And then there's the idea of using, say, symmetry enforcing circuits to encode information about symmetries in the problem into the ansatz, thereby decreasing the uh, size of the subspace that one needs to explore. And I'll discuss these things in more detail as well. Um, contrasted to this sort of fixed ansatz approach, there's another class of methods in which the ansatz itself, the sort of the structure and the gates is learned on the fly. Um, this approach was sort of begun with the uh, approach known as ADAPT VQE um, and then has uh, developed into various directions. And the key idea here is that um, one iteratively builds up a, an ansatz using different gates based on some criteria to try to minimize the overall energy. And uh, this includes uh, versions not only for VQE on uh, say molecular systems, but also for optimization as in ADAPT QAOA and many other different variants that use other information such as mutual information in order to uh, achieve convergence. Uh, similarly, there's a number of uh, genetic uh, sort of approaches which have uh, sort of more complicated structures that can both build and prune, for instance, uh, different gates from the ansatz. And there's also a um, similar approach known as uh, iterative coupled, uh, qubit coupled cluster um, method. So I'll talk a bit more about these as well later on. So now let's move on to the question of how to perform measurements in the context of VQAs. So then of course, the key question is how can we measure these observables that we need to calculate, say the cost function efficiently on a quantum computer? 
Well, we can take a generic observable O, which maybe is a sum of a number of different terms, and we can decompose that into a set of poly strings, um, P, I, J. Um, then a natural strategy to take it toward measurement is to group these different uh, operators into commuting sets of poly strings. And the advantage here is that if you have a commuting set, you can measure these uh, poly strings simultaneously and you only need therefore one state preparation uh, for each set. But how do you go about doing that? Um, well, if you say only have single qubit measurements available, it makes sense to group these polys into qubit wise commuting sets so that PI and PJ uh, two different poly strings here um, uh, commute at the level of the individual qubits. Um, on the other hand, if multi qubit measurements are available, then it makes sense to instead say group polys into fully commuting sets, where by using the multi qubit gates, you can change the basis and rotate into a basis in which um, these poly strings are simultaneously diagonal prior to the measurement. Now, this expression here, this qubit wise commuting up on uh, above is a stronger uh, condition than just uh, commuting in general. And you can see this easily from the example of say XX and ZZ operators where um, these do not commute qubit wise because X1 and Z1 do not commute. But whereas as full poly strings, they do commute and therefore can be simultaneously diagonalized and measured. So the key point here is that far fewer measurements are required if we group polys into fully commuting sets instead of merely qubit wise commuting sets. Now the accuracy in estimating the expectation value under consideration is ultimately related to the variance of the observer. The expression is shown here, the details are not too important, but I'd just like to point out that it's possible to find an optimal measurement count of measurements that one needs in order to achieve a particular um, error epsilon in the resulting measurement. Now, in general, the uh, number of measurements that you need will also depend on the particular state under consideration. But of course, when we're doing the algorithm, we don't know what the state is going to be um, a priori. And so it makes sense to say to average the required number of measurements over all possible states in the Hilbert space. So if we look at the ratio then of the average number of measurements required without any groupings divided by the average number of measurements with groupings averaged over the different states, we can find the following expression and thereby if we maximize this expression, we will minimize the number of measurements that we need to do overall. Now, the, the form of the expression here suggests that we group these commuting operators according to the magnitudes of their coefficients in order to maximize this expression. However, unfortunately, it turns out that maximizing this function is an NP-hard problem, but Crawford et al. and others have developed heuristic approaches that are, uh, uh, attempt essentially to uh, perform this maximization. And now I'd just like to point out that there's you know, many other different polygrouping schemes that have been proposed for partitioning you know, the different poly operators into groups that can be uh, measured simultaneously. Um, and I certainly don't have time to go through all of the details of these different approaches and their advantages and disadvantages. I'll just note that a number of these methods are related to solving certain uh, problems in graph theory. And these uh, problems typically also are NP hard to solve, but as I mentioned, there's approximate algorithms that exist. Uh, to sort of come up with uh, partial solutions. And finally, I'll just mention that several of these different approaches aim to ultimately minimize the number of commuting sets. However, it's not always optimal to do this depending, for instance, on the weights of the different uh, terms in the poly expansion. So many of the um, variational quantum algorithms, uh, when it comes to optimization, they often use gradient-based methods to perform that. And therefore measuring gradients is also an important task on these uh, near-term quantum devices for VQAs in general. And the measurement of gradients can be performed using the so-called parameter shift rule. And this is a very nice result, um, which states that gradients can be determined actually exactly for certain classes of gates. For instance, those arising from poly strings, which is what we're sort of naturally decomposing our operators into. And you can see here on the right then that the cost function f, if you consider the derivative with respect to some variational parameter theta, which is associated on the left here with some generator g, this derivative can be obtained just by looking at the difference of the cost function at two different values of, uh, um, based in the following expression here. So plus or minus pi over four r, where r here is um, 
So basically the, so plus or minus R is the eigenvalue of the corresponding generator G. So in the case of polystrings, this has eigenvalues plus or minus one, R is just equal to one. And by measuring the cost function then at these two different values and taking the difference, one actually gets the exact gradient rather uh, than an approximate one. Uh, this uh, sort of parameter shift rule approach uh, works not only for poly uh, strings, but can also be generalized in various ways beyond uh, to different standard gates. There's a stochastic version of this uh, uh, gradient measurement and even works for non-unitary uh, cases as well. So uh, in the third part here, I'd like to uh, mention um, some of the challenges associated with optimization of uh, variational quantum eigen uh, variational quantum algorithms. So one of the key uh, considerations um, and key challenges that has been discussed over the past few years is the phenomenon of what are called barren plateaus. And barren plateaus are, can be summarized as essentially the situation in which a cost function has gradients that vanish exponentially in the number of qubits. So if you look at the lower left here, you see the a map of the cost function um, when there are four qubits, which is uh, the blue here, versus 24 qubits, which is in the orange. And you can see that simply increasing the system size makes the cost function landscape much flatter and makes the uh, minima here much narrower and therefore harder to locate. The same information is basically conveyed here on the right as well, where you see that the variance of the gradients decreases exponentially with the number of increase in the number of qubits uh, for sufficiently deep uh, layered circuits. Um, I'd like to point out that this barren plateau phenomena occurs, um, the, the occurrence of it sort of depends on the choice of the cons cost function, in particular, the choice of the ansatz. Um, and specifically, these sort of deep unstructured circuits, like say the brick layer circuit, have an issue in that they have too much at the root of this problem of barren plateaus, the flatness of the resulting cost function when sampled sort of at random points in the parameter space. Um, now, barren plateau phenomena occurs not only in the noiseless case, um, but it can also occur in the context of noisy quantum systems as well, as mentioned in this uh, work here. And I'd just like to uh, point out that a lot of work on barren plateaus uh, over the past few years has been performed, especially by the Los Alamos group. And here's some additional references on this uh, subject. Um, to mention briefly then, what are possible remedies of this barren plateau phenomenon? Well, I noted that random circuits are ultimately problematic um, for barren plateaus. And so one way to um, deal with this is to enforce structure into the problem, say, by focusing, you know, using, say, for instance, various symmetries in order to reduce the size of the subspace that's being explored. Another tactic would be to sort of de-randomize the choice of initial parameters. You know, the phenomenon was originally observed when one looked at sort of random points in the parameter space. However, if you initialize in such a way as to uh, produce blocks of gates that all begin with the identity um, initialization, um, this can potentially help mitigate the problem of barren plateaus. Another method is to look, take more of a layered learning approach as in this paper by Skolik et al. Um, where uh, progressively uh, circuit layers are added to the ansatz and optimized sequentially. And then uh, at a given stage in the process, the previous layers are initialized to the prior optimal values from the previous runs. And using this sort of approach, it was shown that the success probability of um, the optimization can be increased significantly using the layered method compared to uh, other approaches. So finally, I'd like to touch a little bit uh, about uh, the effects of noise in the system and more specifically, how one can uh, different, use different strategies to try to mitigate uh, those problems. So one uh, popular and very useful method of uh, noise mitigation is a so-called extrapolation approach. And the fundamental idea here is that one wants to essentially stretch the computation time, which effectively increases the amount of error or decoherence in the system. And then by doing that artificially, one can then attempt to extrapolate backwards down to the zero noise limit to get a more accurate estimate of the true expectation value if there was no noise at all. This can be done in various ways. On the one hand, it can be performed sort of on the hardware level, whereby you, for instance, stretch out the particular pulses that are performed uh, to uh, enact various quantum gates, thereby increasing the computation time and increasing the chance for error. 
but it can also be done sort of on the algorithmic level whereby one inserts additional gates into the circuit, which uh, in the ideal case would uh, basically amount to being an identity gate. Uh, for instance, these two C naughts ideally cancel out and such that the top and the bottom circuits here are the same. But of course, in the presence of noise, this cancellation is not perfect. And therefore, by artificially introducing more of these identity uh, type uh, gates, um, one can increase the noise level and then use that to extrapolate backwards and achieve uh, improved estimation of the expectation values. A second approach um, is to try to look, for instance, at trying to mitigate the effect of, say, readout errors. And one method that's been explored in this context is to um, model the different types of readout errors that can occur as a form of a Markov process. And then by applying the inverse of this uh, Markov process, one can essentially undo the effect of the readout errors. And in the figure here, shown for uh, an experiment on a Fermi Hubbard model simulation, um, when the energy here in green is the energy without any mitigation, which is, does not very much match the noiseless uh, case here down in blue. But by applying this Markov process and mitigation, one can see that you achieve a much uh, better, uh, much greater accuracy in the measurement. Um, a third approach is to uh, use some kind of symmetry enforcement method in which one, for instance, post selects on different outcomes, measurement outcomes that are consistent with, say, known constraints in the problem. For instance, if you know that you're investigating a physical Hamiltonian, which cannot change the particle number of the system, and you know what, say, the number of particles is from independent considerations, considerations, then if you perform a measurement and you find results with the wrong number of particles, you can throw those away. Um, that's sort of one approach based on post-selection. Another method would be to sort of build symmetry constraints into the ansatz itself, which I'll talk about more uh, later on. And here too, you can see that in the case where there's no symmetry enforcement in blue, um, the error is not great, but by applying various versions of uh, symmetry verification, one can improve um, the uh, level of the error in the calculation. So at this point, I'll just pause briefly and ask uh, for questions. Great. Uh, so we do have uh, one question in the chat, which is um, a bit hard to answer, but I think it will promote a good discussion. So the question is, uh, what, what is the computational complexity of these variational quantum algorithms? Yeah, that's, that is a good question. Um, I mean, it really depends on the particular algorithm you're dealing with. And in general, these are sort of heuristic algorithms, right? So, um, you know, you can make ansatzes that are simpler, you can make ansatzes that are more complicated, but it's hard to come up with uh, really rigorous uh, results, I would say, about computational complexity. Um, and, and that's sort of a key issue is in, you know, discussing this for the future, you know, are these methods going to scale, say, to problems where quantum advantage is possible? Um, I think uh, more work needs to be done essentially on that issue, um, both on the numerical side, you know, trying to do larger simulations, and then also, you know, investigating to what extent one can make uh, rigorous statements about these issues. Um, maybe I'll ask one question and then if uh, during this people want to ask more in the Q&A uh, so that we have another one. But I was wondering, you mentioned, maybe you'll, you'll mention this in the second half of the tutorial, more about the ADAPT VQE approach. So this is about um, sort of constructing the ansatz and doing the training. Have you uh, benchmarked this uh, compared to other approaches and sort of in your experience, how well does it perform? Is it, is it always outperforming say like a fixed ansatz or does the additional optimization you need to do over, over the, the gate set um, cause a problem? Uh, what, what are your, your thoughts here? Yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, that is something that I will talk more about in the second part. So I'll wait and uh, uh, sort of answer that in the, in the following then, if that's all right. Excellent, excellent. Um, so we do have one more question. Uh, and I think this is a good question. Uh, what is the underlying reason behind barren plateaus? Does it have anything to do with the shot noise? Yeah, so I, I think um, for that, one has to sort of distinguish, that's a good question. One has to distinguish between sort of the noise-induced barren plateaus, which is related to um, noise, for instance, and so there's shot noise. But I guess, yeah, you also have shot noise in the other case as well, uh, even for noiseless uh, systems. But um, I would say, ultimately, it's really about 
the expressibility of, of the ansatz. And so essentially by having a large, you know, the ability to really cover a huge amount of the Hilbert space, um, it essentially becomes ultimately very flat um, because, uh, you know, large regions of the Hilbert space essentially don't care about the particular problem under consideration. And so um, I, I think there's still some questions that need to be answered in that respect, but I think it's ultimately tied to the, um, just the expressibility of, of the uh, system or the, the ansatz rather. Great, uh, maybe one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think this is a good question. For the symmetry po uh, post-selection noise mitigation, if we throw away some states, uh, this affects the normalization. Uh, so how would one uh, correct for that? Yeah, that, that's a good question too. Um, yeah, one has to be careful about um, basically doing that in a careful uh, way, basically, but but there is a method. I, I'm not recalling the details exactly of how to do that, but it, it is possible to account for um, those those issues um, in, in the process. Um, so yeah, sorry, I, I, you'd have to look more into um, the literature uh, for that, unfortunately. Great, well, I'll just remind everyone to, to keep asking questions uh, throughout the talk so we, we have more of them ready at the end. And I think uh, we can continue through with the second half of the tutorial now, John. All right, thanks. So now I'll switch from more of these uh, general considerations to uh, two particular applications. First, I'll talk a little bit about uh, many body fermionic problems. Um, and then optimization problems. So for these uh, fermionic sort of quantum mechanics problems, you know, there's a number of different areas in which uh, these applications exist. For instance, in quantum chemistry, one might want to find, uh, say, ground state molecular energies, uh, as I mentioned earlier. It's, there's also uh, many different problems in condensed matter physics that are interesting to explore uh, using VQAs. For instance, trying to understand the ground state of the Hubbard model in two dimensions. This is related to the uh, question of high temperature superconductivity. Um, for, there's also the fractional quantum Hall effect. And in general, these uh, systems in condensed matter physics typically are strongly correlated systems, which um, cannot be perfectly studied using just um, ordinary classical computational methods, which motivates the use of quantum computing in this regard. There's also uh, corresponding problems in high energy and nuclear physics that could take advantage of this approach. And not only are there um, sort of questions about static properties of quantum systems, but dynamics is another interesting area to uh, explore um, these applications. On the side of optimization problems, a lot of work has been done uh, starting with the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, which sort of got this uh, aspect of the field kicked off. And um, these sort of problems are broadly applicable for various uh, issues in engineering, business, finance, et cetera. And so there's been a lot of interest and in research um, in that direction as well. So first I'll just talk a bit more about the physics type applications. Um, and uh, variational quantum eigensolvers for molecules. And so this uh, flowchart here is pretty much very similar to the ones that I've been showing previously, but now specified to the case of this molecular problem, where one starts with a particular molecular Hamiltonian, say written in uh, terms of fermionic operators, which then needs to be encoded into the quantum computer somehow, which I'll discuss uh, shortly. And then once you've done that, you can prepare and measure states to get the energy. And as I've already mentioned, optimization back and forth between the classical computer ultimately will allow you to produce some uh, observable uh, measurement of, uh, such as the uh, ground state energies, excited state energies, say it's a function of bond distance or some other parameter in the system. So there have been a number of experiments on uh, VQAs for chemistry applications on hardware, for instance, uh, by the IBM group, by uh, Google and other groups. And these uh, experiments have shown that for various uh, small molecules, um, it's possible to attain a pretty accurate results on real quantum hardware uh, once appropriate, appropriate uh, error and noise mitigation techniques have been applied. Um, now, these of course are all for uh, systems that are currently small enough that they can be studied uh, just as well classically. And so part of the challenge going forward then is to see how well VQAs will uh, perform on systems that uh, become more difficult to study um, using traditional methods. So the key uh, question then for this sort of digital quantum simulation of fermionic systems is then the question of mapping 
the fermionic problem onto qubits on a quantum computer. So if we start, say, from a generic fermionic Hamiltonian, which has a non-interacting part here on the left and uh, electron interactions shown here on the right, um, this basic form here encodes essentially pretty much all uh, the interesting problems that one would want to look at, say, in uh, quantum chemistry, for instance. Um, in this approach, the number of qubits that one needs on your quantum device then is essentially equal to the number of orbitals that you want to model in the system. Now, there's many different uh, approaches for mapping uh, fermionic uh, operators onto qubits. And here I'll only discuss uh, probably what is the most popular mapping, which is the so-called jordan Wigner mapping. And this is pretty straightforward. In this approach, each orbital is mapped onto a qubit such that the zero state of the qubit corresponds to the orbital being unoccupied by an electron, and the one state corresponds to an occupied orbital. However, we know that fermions satisfy the Pauli exclusion principle, whereas qubits are just distinguishable. And in, therefore, in order to faithfully represent the fermionic problem, which needs to have uh, this anti-symmetrization, it's important that we have this additional uh, uh, constraint on qubits through the inclusion of so-called z-strings. So you can see here that the fermionic creation operator, a dagger, is um, proportional, is equal to this uh, qubit operators on the right, where the x and the y basically uh, allow you to switch between occupied and unoccupied orbitals, but one additionally has this z-string here uh, present on all the qubits in, um, on the device that are uh, before the given uh, qubit under consideration, um, which can become quite large in a, in a large uh, quantum computer. And so this uh, then presents a challenge uh, for uh, mapping purposes. So, um, Again, there's in the context of quantum simulation and quantum chemistry, there's many different onsatses. Uh, basically, the onsatses I talked about before have all seen uh, realization and use here. Um, with the hardware efficient onsats, you know, I mentioned that it's good for uh, in terms of fidelities that are achievable in the gates. But uh, the challenge with this approach is that it tends to be inefficient because it samples too much of the Hilbert space, thereby making it difficult to optimize um, due to the Baron Plateau phenomenon, as I mentioned earlier. On the other hand, uh, one also has the chemistry-inspired UCC onsats, which performs very well in classical simulations, but it can yield impractically long circuits. And as I suggested uh, sort of briefly before, the key idea behind the UCC is that one starts with this, um, say, particular initial state, which could be, say, the mean field or Hartree-Fox solution to the problem, and then applies uh, various combinations of single excitations of electrons and double excitations or potentially higher uh, excitations um, in some well-defined uh, circuit here and then optimizes over some variation of parameters associated with each of these different types of excitations. So those are sort of more generic onsatses. And in terms of the problem tailored side, um, we again have the so-called variational Hamiltonian onsatz. And uh, this is a fixed uh, onsatz form, but it's composed of multiple repeated layers of different unitary operations acting on your state vector. Um, and these uh, particular uh, gates are ultimately composed using terms HK that appear in the original Hamiltonian under consideration. So in that way, uh, knowledge about the problem in the Hamiltonian is built into the particular wave function onsatz itself. And this um, particular onsatz has been explored in a number of different papers, and it's been found to be uh, really quite successful at, at uh, optimizing and finding the ground state of various um, fermionic problems, also um, spin or qubit problems. And it also has a relatively shallow depth, uh, is sort of a compact onsatz. And I'd like to specifically mention this more recent paper by uh, Weirsman et al., which did a, a pretty comprehensive study on uh, the icing model and the XXZ chain uh, to spin Hamiltonians from condensed matter physics and found that this uh, onsatz works quite well uh, for those cases. Um, secondly, what I'd like to discuss in a bit more detail is the concept of using uh, symmetry enforcing circuits as a particular uh, fixed uh, but problem tailored onsatz uh, for VQAs. So in a nutshell, the idea behind a symmetry enforcing onsatz is that you're ultimately interested in creating particular uh, states, namely the ground state of the system, and you're not so much concerned with the ultimate the unitary evolution operator that you're doing, that you're using to get there. Therefore, one can uh, just go and count and parameterize all the relevant states within a given symmetry. So if H here is the full Hilbert space, we know that the ground state will live in some subspace 
which is defined by certain symmetry of say by particle number or uh, spin of the uh, corresponding system. And then by imposing these types of symmetries at the circuit level, we basically force the variational algorithm and the optimizer to only search within this reduced subspace, increasing the chance that we can find the true ground state at a lower depth or cost. So we know, as I said before, that for a system of n orbitals, we generically have n qubits present. And therefore, an arbitrary state in the full Hilbert space has an exponential number of parameters uh, to parameterize it. But if we only have, say, m number of particles or fermions, then the number of variational parameters that we need is reduced from that full amount. And the key uh, ingredient then of producing uh, this sort of symmetry enforced state is to have a gate which is particle number preserving, such as this uh, so called A swap exchange type gate shown here. Um, then one can imagine constructing a circuit which is initialized by an appropriate number of uh, X uh, operators to. Uh, put you into a particular particle number subspace starting from the empty vacuum state. And then when you can layer these uh, A-type gates in some repeated structure here, and it's been shown that this type of layering for sufficient depth is able to um, exactly encode and reach any uh, state in the subspace of the Hilbert space with a fixed number of particles. By using this sort of approach, we are able to minimize the total number of optimization parameters that are required to solve this problem. And it's also a hardware friendly method because it only requires say nearest neighbor coupling to achieve um, this kind of circuit. So this um, has been studied uh, also in uh, various simulations. And we see here on the left, for instance, that by using this sort of A swap uh, symmetry preserving uh, ansatz, one can achieve uh, say better um, energy error than some of these hardware efficient uh, type ansatzes. And furthermore, as I suggested on the previous slide, this also translates into a lower number of different uh, parameters, variational parameters in the ansatz that are required, and also often ends up producing a lower overall number of C not gates compared to other uh, hardware efficient ansatzes. And while this uh, result here is shown for a noiseless uh, simulation, it's also been shown uh, to perform uh, well, when in the presence of uh, noisy um, simulations or devices. So now um, I'd like to go a bit more into uh, the question of these adaptively generated ansatzes. And so you can think of this sort of scale here in terms of the different flavors with problem agnostic on the far left. I just discussed some of these problem tailored but fixed ansatzes. And now there's the idea of basically allowing the ansatz to be created dynamically during the process of optimization. So the catchphrase here then is that the quantum computer itself learns the ansatz as it goes. And there's uh, sort of two important elements to consider in constructing this type of ansatz. One of course is which gates you should use to build up the, um, the ansatz as you go. And the other is the particular choice of update strategy uh, in order to construct it. So, um, this direction was sort of uh, inaugurated with the so-called adaptive VQE method, um, which is short for adaptive derivative assemble of problem tailored VQE. Um, and as I said, this uh, approach allows the simulated system to dictate its own ansatz and learn it on the fly. And it therefore is sort of uh, naturally a compact ansatz because it only grows the ansatz to the extent as is necessary in order to find and converge to the solution. Um, so the general approach then is that it uses a predefined pool of operators, which are essentially the building blocks from which this ansatz will be iteratively constructed. And it applies these unitaries one by one um, in order to minimize the energy. So the question is, how do you then decide which operators in the pool to apply at a given step in the ansatz? Well, you know, we're applying these sequentially to the reference state. And so a particular uh, step one can determine which operator is best to apply, for instance, by taking the gradient of the energy with respect to the corresponding variational parameter theta. And this expression can then also be determined uh, by calculation of this commutator H between H and A, the, the new uh, operator under consideration for inclusion. And by measuring this on hardware, one can um, determine what is the best operator to include next in the development of the ansatz. So the overall uh, picture of this approach then uh, can be shown in this sort of flow chart, where again, one starts by initializing for some particular state, such as the Hartree-Fock state. And then one takes all of the operators in your predefined pool 
and measures the gradients associated with adding each one of these operators separately to the current state of the, how the ansatz is defined. Um, at this point, one looks at the values of these gradients, and if those are below a certain threshold, one considers the problem to be solved, and then one can calculate you know, any other observable of interest. However, if the gradients of one of these at least exceeds the uh, set tolerance, then one selects the operator with the largest gradient out of this pool and uses that to grow the ansatz. Um, now, having grown the ansatz, one then performs an additional uh, VQE, which re-optimizes all of the different parameters that are present included at a particular stage. And then one iterates this loop until convergence has been achieved. So now I'll uh, show some results uh, using this ADAPT VQE method, and in particular using it for a fermionic pool of operators. So this operator pool is essentially similar to the operators that uh, enter into the UCC um, ansatz, the chemistry inspired ansatz I discussed earlier, in that it consists of basically sums of single uh, electron and two electron excitations. And in the top uh, row of figures here, we see for three different molecular systems, what is the energy error, the difference between the variationally optimized error and the true ground state error calculate, or true ground state energy calculated exactly, um, you know, for these uh, small systems. And one can see that for the ADAPT uh, cases, which are shown in red, purple, and brown, for various uh, different uh, tolerances of the gradient criterion, all of these cases, um, at least in some regimes, uh, can be used to uh, obtain chemical uh, accuracy of the uh, resultant converged solution, um, which is essentially the target for any of these uh, uh, you know, problems dealing in quantum chemistry. Um, this is compared, for instance, say to the UCCSD ansatz shown in orange here, which, although it seems to do all right with lithium hydride, uh, is not capable of achieving the um, chemical level of chemical accuracy, for instance, for this H6 molecule at a large bond distances. So not only is this uh, adaptive procedure uh, sort of more accurate, say, than the UCCSD uh, method, it also uh, uses a smaller number of parameters in general. And that's shown here in the lower uh, panel of plots where the, again, the orange is the number, now the number of parameters in the UCC SD ansatz compared to the various uh, versions of the ADAPT ansatz shown here, which in general require many fewer parameters than um, the UCC SD. And in the case where the ADAPT ended up requiring more, uh, this was a case in which the UCC SD uh, failed anyway. So um, as I mentioned earlier, dynamics uh, of quantum systems is also an interesting approach for um, studying using uh, variational quantum algorithms. And in this case, one can consider, for instance, the Lindblad equation, which controls the evolution, say, of the quantum uh, density matrix uh, as a function of time under the action of some Lindbladian operator, which includes both unitary but also non-unitary evolution uh, due to, uh, say, interaction with the environment. Now, uh, starting from this Lindblad operator, one can define the so-called McLaughlin distance if you take the uh, density matrix and parameterize it by some uh, variational angles theta, then um, this uh, difference here basically corresponds to the difference of the parameterized evolution from the true evolution of the system of the full uh, density matrix, which is not parameterized. And therefore, by uh, updating these parameters in order to minimize this McLaughlin distance using the so-called McLaughlin variational principle, one can approximate the uh, evolution of the true system dynamics uh, variationally. Um, so this uh, approach has been studied in a number of works. For instance, here um, I'm showing the results for a two qubit icing model, which ha has amplitude damping applied. And you can see that the exact evolution, uh, which is shown in the light blue here, is matched very well uh, by the variational evolution in the orange dots uh, here, where one plots the um, expectation value of uh, sigma z, say, on the first uh, qubit, so some magnetization there. Um, this uh, method has also been explored, say, for the xy model in transverse field, where here the Iowa State group uh, sort of combined ideas of adaptive uh, VQE, um, you know, iterative update of the ansatz with the dynamic simulation and here, for this model as well, on six qubits, they found that the variational um, evolution 
uh, corresponding to the red here, um, very closely matches the exact evolution in the energy. Um, similarly, for the um, expectation values or the correlation functions in the system, the uh, different spin correlation functions. And finally, they also uh, showed that the number of two cubic gates needed to perform this um, variational uh, time evolution is significantly less than the number of qubits used, say, in just a direct trotterization of the corresponding evolution operator. So now I'd like to discuss, um, sort of switch gears and talk about the question of optimization problems uh, using uh, variational quantum algorithms. And it's known that many different optimization problems can be actually formulated in terms of icing Hamiltonian problems uh, for some icing Hamiltonian C. There's a sort of recipes that will take generic optimization problems and give them this sort of form. It, in the resulting, uh, sort of icing Hamiltonian, the solution to that problem then is encoded in uh, the nature of the ground state itself of that model. And so uh, to give just one example, the so-called weighted max cut uh, problem in graph theory um, can be given this uh, sort of icing Hamiltonian type formulation here. So the question then is how do you go about solving uh, these icing Hamiltonian uh, problems? And one uh, very popular and um, useful technique for doing this is the so-called QAOA algorithm, a uh, quantum approximate optimization algorithm, which is uh, inspired by the adiabatic uh, evolution of the system. So in this approach, one starts from an initial state, which is simply the product state of all plus states on the individual qubits, um, which is an eigenstate of what's known as the mixer Hamiltonian, which is just uh, basically the sum of the individual X operators acting on each qubit. Then the QAOA ansatz then has the following structure, where starting from that initial state, one alternately applies uh, the cost Hamiltonian and the mixture Hamiltonian um, one after the other with associated uh, variational parameters, uh, gamma and beta, which correspond to different uh, essential evolution times under the, different, um, the, under the two different Hamiltonians. Um, then one simply using this ansatz performs a VQE in order to minimize the resulting cost function thereby uh, hopefully finding the ground state and therefore the solution to the optimization problem. Um, so the QAA has um, attracted a lot of uh, interest in research and just mentioned a few of the further developments. Um, there's been, for instance, the ansatz so the mixture can, for instance, take a more complex forms. And this can be chosen in such a way, for example, as to encode various problem constraints uh, into, the, uh, into the ansatz itself, which again will help with speeding up convergence. Another approach is to incorporate uh, sort of classical symmetries of the cost function into the analysis, which allows one to reduce uh, the associated cost with the energy evaluation in the procedure. And finally, uh, sort of QAOA uh, methods have also inspired uh, various approaches to uh, preparation of quantum many body states, both uh, sort of pure states, ground states, um, but also for um, you know, thermal Gibbs states as well. So now I'd just like to sort of summarize with an outlook. Um, so I, I think I've shown that there's been sort of enormous progress on the development of EQAs um, over the past uh, several years, and that there's been a number of successful demonstration of these methods on uh, small scale problems. Of course, the key question uh, going towards the future is to try to understand better what are the possibilities for scaling this, these approaches towards the quantum advantage regime. And I think in order to do that successfully, it would be good uh, sort of to increase the dialogue between all of these different methods that have been proposed with all of their various advantages and disadvantages and to make really a, a strong effort to make direct comparisons um, between these different methods. Um, to that end, I think I'd like to sort of make a proposal um, that one should have sort of a generic test case that you know, many different groups could use to study and therefore more easily compare results. And I think that the so-called XXZ spin chain, which is this quantum uh, many body, uh, sort of a generalization of the uh, Heisenberg model, Heisenberg spin model, but with uh, anisotropic interactions, I think this can really serve as sort of a minimal model for, um, you know, studying these VQAs uh, in more detail because it sort of has a tunability in that one can just simply increase the, the length of the chain, making the problem transition from the easy to simulate to the much harder to simulate uh, scale.
And also because of the presence of this uh, third uh, term here, it's actually an interacting problem. Um, and therefore it is challenging classically to, to solve. Um, and so uh, with that, I would just like to uh, basically put up a list of some uh, recommended review articles where you can learn more about the different issues that I've uh, discussed uh, today. And thanks everyone for listening. <laughs>